All right, everyone, good morning. I was told to get started right at 10.15, so it's 10.15. Uh, my name's Paul Evans. I'm a product line manager for the Mac OS platform of Workspace ONE uh, at VMware. Uh, and today I'll be talking about how uh, you can use this paradigm called desired state management to help uh, your organizations leverage more automation and, and some advanced workflows while still maintaining flexibility. Uh, and, and desired state management isn't a necessarily new idea. Uh, it's largely been historically used for server management and, and for virtualization. But I think we've really reached the point in the technology where it becomes more useful for end user devices as well. Uh, so a lot of people might find it benefits them without really uh, having used it in the past yet. Uh. But I'm stuck on this slide. All right. Uh, so a quick overview of the agenda. Uh, so I'll start with why automation is, is so important for uh, device management in particular. Uh, and what are some of those cases where it can actually go wrong and, and potentially cause you issues down the line? Uh, what are the core principles of desired state management and how do they help? Uh, and if in this session I'm able to convince any of you that these ideas actually make sense and they're useful, I, I just recommend in all of the subsequent sessions at this conference, just keep them in mind and, and think about how all the tools and topics can fit into this overall mindset. Uh, but then finally, I do want to showcase uh, Workspace ONE in particular and some of the uh, new features that we're building out that really embrace this concept and how they let you do some new and interesting things. Uh, so to start with automation, why is it cool uh, and what problems does it bring you? Uh, and I think nothing really uh, makes the point better for why orchestration and, and automation is, is really important, more than just the state of the work environment over the past couple of years. Uh, things like the pandemic, the proliferation of remote and hybrid work, uh, the quote unquote great resignation where uh, employees are demanding all sorts of flexibilities from their employers. Uh, really puts these uh, organizations in a spot where they have to uh, be able to really change how they do business at a very core level uh, very quickly. Uh, and they have to be able to constantly adapt and remain flexible to meet all of these new use cases. Uh, and that's not localized any, uh, any particular spot in these, in these organizations. Uh, line of business, HR, finance, legal, IT, of course, all have these, uh, these new necessities that they have to be able to adapt to. Uh, but as things tend to work, the onus always falls back on IT to help all of these different business units. You have to help them be able to orchestrate their complex flows. You have to help them use the right tools and processes uh, and make sure that everybody has access to what they need. So it's really on IT to build out their automation capabilities as quickly as they can. Uh, but as you do this, uh, there are a number of pitfalls you can potentially encounter if you over-rely on automation. Uh, and, and somewhat paradoxically, you, you can actually end up in a place where you have less control and, and less understanding of your environment than you used to before. Uh, if you just have lots of processes running in the background, handling all sorts of different workflows, uh, it becomes hard to know what's going on. And that's especially true as you have turnover or, or new members joining your IT team, the more senior members moving to other roles or, or leaving that organization entirely. Uh, you, you really just end up in a spot where uh, some of that tribal knowledge becomes really critical. You need those core people around who understands how things work. And you can almost paralyze your environment where you have all of these legacy configurations that are doing really important things and you don't know the risks of changing them. So you end up not being able to change them. Uh, we're in a state now with automation where you can push out configurations, apps, et cetera, faster and farther reaching than, than ever before. But the same is also true of issues. When issues occur, they tend to be very far reaching. They tend to impact a lot of the environment. And the expectations to solve them quickly are, are there as well. Uh, so you're in a space where a lot of things become high priority when in the path that might not have been the case. Uh, and a lot of configurations you really end up building in an environment are, are what I would call reactive, uh, which means you have some issue you need to address, you have some specific new requirement from the security team or from the business, and so you write the script or create the workflow to handle that. Uh, but over time, all of these start to accumulate, uh, and you kind of lose track of why something was important, what business need was it solving, uh, what was the point of making it in the, use, in the first case, and, and what's everything that it actually touches from a configuration standpoint. 
Uh, so going back to this idea of environment paralysis, uh, you end up with situations where you're trying to implement something new, but there's some other configuration from long ago that might have been before your time even uh, that's causing you issues now. So you have to first spend your time researching why does that exist in the first place uh, and, and how do I make it fit in with what I want to do now. Uh, and then finally, troubleshooting just becomes harder and harder and harder every single day. When those issues arise and everyone's screaming at you because the entire business is impacted, it's harder to figure out why it's broken in the first place that, than it ever has been in the, uh, in the past. So it's just the perfect kind of uh, scenario of uh, things hitting the fan and, and being impossible to fix very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so let me walk through some specific examples that I've seen over the years, working with uh, organizations managing Macs and, and often using very sophisticated tools in order to do so, uh, but sometimes just their organizational structure uh, or their internal processes or, or sometimes just a lack of foresight uh, is, is putting the, them in these positions where even if the tool set itself might be okay, uh, they're not in a place where they can scale or, or be very flexible when it comes to managing their devices. Uh, the first one is something I see quite a lot, and, and my example here is uh, the incredible massive onboarding script, uh, where you run the script on a brand new device and it does everything you ever need to do to set up everything that device needs. And it works perfectly when it works perfectly, uh, but as soon as something goes wrong, you're, you're suddenly troubleshooting this hundreds and hundreds of line long script, uh, and it's not always clear which part of it is, is causing issues, uh, not everybody understands the intricacies of that script, uh, and it's, it, it's really just a nightmare to handle any type of potential issue that comes down the line or to make changes with it. Uh, sometimes as you try to make new changes to it, new additions, it ends up introducing new issues that weren't there in the first place. Uh, and that tribal knowledge becomes really, really important, uh, and, and especially getting newer team members the ability to understand the environment is, is almost impossible. Uh, another very common scenario is where you have different teams that are working together but are uh, leveraging data from different sources. And, and I think the perfect example for this is when you have a dedicated security team uh, using some sort of dedicated security tool in addition to the team that manages the, the devices at a more uh, core level. Uh, so you, when, a, when a security incident does occur, you end up in these situations where often uh, the security team is making demands of that core device management team. The core device management team is introducing new configurations to meet those demands, but they don't really have visibility into uh, what exactly is being solved, how are you able to track the success of this configuration, uh, and then it's sometimes tough to really compare. Uh, I can tell my config was implemented, but how do I really know how well it's mitigating that security risk? Uh, and so these are the types of things that really end up in that kind of legacy configuration stack where uh, people will forget why they're important and how they were implemented. Uh, but that's doubly true in organizations that are having dedicated teams for each of their platforms. Uh, and I'm not gonna get too deep into the argument of the pros or the cons of unified or, or dedicated teams, uh, but you do run the risk of, uh, as each of these platform teams is responding to the day-to-day -day demands of managing their devices, over time, the way that those environments are managed will tend to drift apart from each other. Uh, so the, 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 the configurations will be different, the environments will tend to be structured in different ways, and when there are initiatives that require those teams to work together, uh, whether it's solving a security issue or some sort of new user experience initiative or, or anything like that, it can be very tough to coordinate those uh, in ways that are consistent, both with the end users and the admin teams when those environments are quite far apart. Uh, and then finally, uh, as you build out a lot of these more advanced workflows, uh, often organizations are very rigid in, in kind of how they're implemented and very hesitant to uh, change how things are implemented. So a lot of them are very hesitant about adopting new types of use cases. And that could be something of, oh, I traditionally use Windows and I don't want to adopt Mac. Uh, it could be something like we support uh, corporate devices, we don't want to, uh, to support BYOD, uh, but just in general, uh, they tend to lack that flexibility when sometimes it would really benefit the users. Uh, so let's talk about desired state management and what are some of those principles that can really help address some of these challenges. And there's really three main pillars here. Uh, so the first is proactively and fully defining what that desired state is. Uh, so this is things like what are all the apps that need to be installed? What settings need to be configured and how are they configured? 
uh, and includes what are your compliance policies and your security requirements that you need to maintain. Uh, must all devices be encrypted? Uh, are you using multi-factor auth? Do you have to adopt new Mac OS versions within a certain period? Uh, are there certain vulnerabilities that your team is monitoring for that you need to make sure don't affect your environment? Things like that. Uh, you need to understand what is all the data that your full team needs and how is that data getting reported? Uh, if you have more than one tool in your environment, which, uh, which data is which tool responsible for? Uh, and then finally, what are your actual desired cases? How many different use cases, how many different personas do you have to support? Will you have different desired states for, for Windows and Mac? Are you supporting BYOD and corporate devices, uh, et cetera? Uh, and then in the second, uh, the second uh, principle of desired state management, it's really around how you organize your total set of configurations. Uh, you want to think about that overall set of requirements that you've built out, uh, and you want to combine them wherever it logically makes sense, but also minimize all of your dependencies when it's not critical. Uh, so when you have multiple configurations that are all always going to be deployed together and they depend on each other, that's when you combine them. Uh, and I think a really good example of that is just think of a uh, standard application you deploy to, to Mac. Uh, often you have your installer package, maybe you have like a configuration script you run after the fact, maybe you have a privacy preferences payload. Uh, technically it's three unique configurations, but logically all of them are required to deploy the app. But if you are deploying multiple apps or you have multiple settings that don't directly uh, rely on each other, you want to keep those distinct. You want to be able to report on those, uh, on those configurations separately. You want to be able to remediate potential issues with those configurations in a way that doesn't affect the others. Uh, and, and you want that flexibility of keeping it transparent of what settings in my environment configure what settings on the device. Uh, and you really want to understand for each of my configurations, which personas does it apply to? Uh, and what is the user experience required for this configuration? A lot of the times you can just push out a setting without telling the end user the app installs in the background and they never have to be the wiser. Sometimes you might want to notify them that something's coming. Uh, sometimes you want a more elaborate experience. Maybe you want to give the user some flexibility in, in scheduling when something gets configured. Uh, and a really good example of those is managing OS updates. Uh, and then finally, where your tool set starts to become more important and where automation starts to be uh, more important is, is handling what's called device drift. Uh, and device drift is really any scenario where the device is not matching your defined desired state. Uh, so if an application is not installed when it should be, uh, or if a uh, setting is not configured the way that it should be, uh, the system should be able to detect that. It should be able to tell the administrators that this drift has occurred, uh, where it's occurred, uh, and it should be able to automatically remediate it, reapply the configurations it needs, uh, and, and perform whatever actions need to be done to map that device back to the desired state. Uh, and this is just constantly happening in the background. So as drift is detected, as it occurs, as devices become non-compliant in any way, the system should just bring it back to that expected state. Uh, but you need to make sure that your tool set is able to provide that flexibility and that user experience that you define for your resources. Uh, and you must ensure that your collective tool set is able to report on all the data you need, but it's able to synthesize it in a way that's actually useful to your teams. If you have two or three or, or even more agents or, or apps installed on these devices, you need some way that you can put that data into that unified dashboard, unified uh, report, uh, whatever it ends up being, so that your teams can work together when they are disjoint and solve whatever the immediate problem is. Uh, so let's go back to uh, those examples from before and just think them through from a desired state type of perspective. Uh, this first one, those monolithic scripts or configurations that are, are kind of like octopuses touching all sorts of different things are, are in direct opposition to it. Uh, if these were just broken out into those individual configurations, even though it seems like more work at first, you save yourself loads more down the line because that environment becomes more transparent, troubleshooting's easier, uh, that tribal knowledge of the environment is not as important. Uh, because you have that transparency between what a configuration is and which settings it's actually affecting. Uh, and troubleshooting becomes much simpler because each setting is independent, 
So if you do go back and modify how one app is deployed, for example, you have a significantly lower risk of uh, affecting any unrelated apps or uh, unrelated settings uh, that would be configured separately. Uh, and in the scenario with that dedicated security team, you've already defined your security and compliance uh, requirements as a full organization. Uh, and so it should be well understood, even if you have separate tools in place, which data comes from, uh, from which of those tools, uh, which team is responsible for which actions during any sort of uh, security response. Uh, and uh, ideally, you would have that tool set where you can actually report on that data together. So if the only way to tell if my configuration is successful is by viewing it in, in that security tool, you would have that unified dashboard to be able to really monitor that in real time. Uh, now, and then as these configurations build up over time, you're constantly kind of reevaluating your desired state. If I need to make a change to respond to a security incident, uh, do I want to make a new configuration or is it just a matter of modifying one of my configurations that I've already made in the past? And by keeping that state, uh, that desired state well defined, uh, you ensure that everything that you still have is important and you can deprecate legacy settings as you need to. Uh, and likewise, the, the same is true when you have just different, uh, different teams managing the respective platforms. Uh, if you're all kind of working out of this common playbook, uh, you, have, you typically have very similar di de desired states overall. Uh, yes, maybe the specific applications are a little bit different or the specific settings are uh, implemented in a different way, but the core security compliance and compliance requirements are gonna be consistent across all the different platforms that you support. Uh, so it makes it so uh, those environments stay consistent over time, and when you do need to collaborate with them, uh, it's a much smaller effort to maintain that consistent user experience and, and, and core reporting requirements uh, because the environments stay similar enough to each other in the first place. Uh, and then finally, uh, adopting new use cases becomes a lot more straightforward as well. The first step of this consideration would be uh, defining what is my desired state that I want to support. And as you do that, you'll tend to find that the vast majority of the resources you've already configured become directly applicable to that desired state. Uh, so the overhead of supporting new use cases and allowing more flexibility tends to be a lot lower uh, for organizations that are using these principles. And so, and so it means you can uh, introduce Max into your environment without that much overhead. You can support BYOD. You can allow more flexibility in, in the types of apps that get deployed or, or things like that. Uh, because the work necessary to do that is not that much compared to what you're already doing today, and you're able to reuse a lot of it. Uh, so that's a lot of high-level discussion around automation and desired state management, but I do want to showcase a little bit how Workspace ONE is actually implementing these principles uh, and, and innovating in some really powerful ways, I think. Uh, and the first feature I want to talk about is Freestyle Orchestrator today. Uh, so Freestyle Orchestra is really centered around that idea, uh, that idea of uh, creating those uh, complex but independent workflows. Uh, so what it essentially allows you to do is take uh, any type of configuration that might have multiple steps or, or might have multiple different components uh, or something that you want to define uh, a very unique user experience for, uh, and it essentially allows you to create that independent workflow that just becomes another assignable object within the platform that you can push out to devices. Uh, and so it contains two different components. Uh, the first are the resources themselves. These are your apps, your scripts, your, uh, your configuration profiles, just those core kind of fundamental building blocks that will encompass the overall workflow. Uh, and you also have your logical conditions. Uh, so things like, is this app already installed on my machine? Does this file exist? Uh, or you can essentially define any custom logic you care as a condition, which we call a sensor. Uh, and you can define what value a device should report, uh, and then compare that value against some sort of expected value. Uh, and based on that comparison, you can determine should this workflow proceed to the next step, or, or should it follow one of multiple different logical branches uh, to ultimately achieve the behavior that you want. But what's really nice about Freestyle uh, is rather than having to create some sort of really complicated script to cover these types of workflows, it's all done in a Canvas UI. So once you define your resources, you can just kind of put them in the order that you need to, apply those logical conditions where it makes sense, uh, and, 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 and then you have it there uh, configured in the environment. Uh, and you can assign the workflow as a whole to your devices, 
Uh, but Workspace, Workspace One will automatically monitor drift for every single step that you define in your workflow. So if any of those individual settings are ever found to be different on the device, it'll reapply that step and it'll be smart enough to potentially reapply the whole workflow as necessary, just to make sure that your devices are staying in that desired state. Uh, so what are some common scenarios where this is useful? Uh, I think that uh, that example of a complex app is a, is a really good one uh, because I run into that one all the time. Uh, some security apps, some of the more complex enterprise apps, you might have like multiple installer packages you have to run in sequence, you have license files you have to run, configuration scripts, maybe you need a privacy preferences payload and a system extension uh, and a content filter and, and whatever else you can possibly think of. Uh, and, and it just gets a little bit overwhelming to define all of those independently. But by combining them logically into that single workflow, you're just treating the entire configuration as install this app on my devices and it becomes easier to work with. Uh, sometimes you need to have a very surgical uh, targeting of a particular configuration. Like maybe you have multiple different conditions you have to define and you want to run some sort of script on devices only if they meet all of those conditions. Uh, but you can easily uh, define those independent conditions uh, and define a workload that essentially says, only if all of these are true will this configuration run on my device. And Workspace ONE can kind of keep monitoring that in the background and, and just run it at the appropriate time. Uh, and you can also build some really complex uh, compliance and remediation types of workflows. You can essentially define non-compliance to mean whatever criteria you want, uh, and then have the, uh, the action taken be whatever you want, either to bring that device back into compliance or to perform some sort of other action like block access to things, remove an app, or, or, or whatever it ultimately might be until that device becomes compliant again. Uh, to switch topics a bit, uh, employee experience is also becoming very, very important with a lot of organizations. Uh, the, the workforce in general is becoming more distributed with a lot of hybrid and, and even remote work uh, being accepted these days. Uh, and providing manual support in, in these cases is, is very complicated and very time consuming. So being able to ensure that people are using their devices effectively uh, and that they're running, not running into issues is incredibly important. Uh, and so the uh, Digital Employee Experience Management Solution, or DEEM, because that's a mouthful, uh, aims to really address those challenges. Uh, and essentially what DEEM does uh, is it brings user experience metrics into data points that you can include in that desired state. Uh, so things like how often certain applications are being launched, how often they crash, how often the system crashes, uh, CPU usage, network usage, things along those lines all become reportable data points. Uh, but you can even combine those with Freestyle Orchestrator in some really cool ways uh, and you can even tie it into third-party integrations. Uh, and, and I think a couple good examples of that are, are let's say you're deploying a new uh, line of business application to, to your devices, uh, a new version of it, and you just want to monitor to see, is it crashing more than expected across my fleet? Uh, and if you do identify any, uh, any devices where it's crashing too much, you automatically open a service desk ticket on those users' behalf, provide them some proactive support before they even necessarily get to the point where they open a ticket on their own. Uh, or maybe there are scenarios where uh, uh, you just want to notify new users, hey, we're, we're doing some sort of change in your environment. If you notice anything that seems odd, just reach out. You can integrate with something like Slack with that application push, just so you're combining those two logical steps together. Uh, or even taking it a step farther, maybe you're monitoring system-wide crashes or, or overarching CPU usage, uh, and you find a couple devices that are crashing very, very frequently, or they're consistently at very high CPU usage, you could integrate with like a procurement tool like Coupa uh, and, and just start a process for a replacement before the actual user device becomes useless to them and, and they're already getting frustrated. Uh, everything that supports a REST API can be integrated with these types of workflows. So it gives you a, a really powerful tool set to support these different types of use cases. Uh, and then finally, I, I hate the marketing word like next gen, but I, I enabled this slide next gen SaaS uh, architecture because that's what our marketing team announced recently. Uh, but if you haven't seen those announcements yet, uh, we have a, a, a couple blog posts recently about this quote unquote next gen SaaS architecture. So I want to spend a minute talking about what that actually means. Uh, but essentially, Workspace ONE uh, has, uh, as a platform, has been built over the past decade or a, uh, decade or a half or so. 
uh, starting in, in the old AirWatch days that some of you might remember. Uh, and obviously, the scope has expanded quite a lot since then. Uh, but over the past couple of years, our team has essentially taken that entire core architecture and rebuilt it from the ground up. Uh, and we did that with two, uh, two main goals in mind. Uh, number one is refactoring that legacy monolithic code base into one that's based on uh, modern microservices. Each microservice is specifically built for certain types of use cases, and they're largely independent of each other, although they can work together when that, uh, when that makes sense. Uh, and the second requirement was to more directly support this concept of desired state management. So the platform will know if a device is meeting its desired state, it'll know what the desired state should be, uh, and it'll easily be able to, or to detect drift and, and then remediate as it needs to. Uh, and so you can probably tell that those two goals are very much what I've just been talking about today, because those same principles that make it easier to manage devices also apply to implementation of the platform itself. Uh, and so uh, that allows administrators using Workspace One a couple direct benefits. Uh, and I think the first benefit is really just incredibly improved performance and scalability. Uh, so performing actions at scale, deploying applications, uh, deploying configurations profiles to kind of your, your large device fleets as a whole, uh, you can expect uh, performance improvements of, of 10 times or more for all of those commands that hit all of your devices from our older architecture. Uh, but you can also scale those environments bigger than ever before. Uh, so if you're managing your device fleet with, with Workspace ONE, you can scale those deployments into the millions uh, of, of any device type while still having good user experience in the admin console uh, and not having to wait for, forever and ever for pages and dashboards to load. Uh, but it also makes it much quicker for our team to be able to adopt new feature sets as well. Uh, so as Apple has WWDC in a couple weeks and they'll announce all sorts of new stuff, we'll be in a position where we can adopt those into our platform very quickly. Uh, but we'll also be able to implement our own feature sets very quickly that are unique to Workspace ONE. Uh, and, and Freestyle Orchestrator is actually the first new feature built off of this new platform. Uh, but you'll be able to see in, in kind of the coming months and, and even years into the future uh, that we're really adopting and embracing new feature sets based around these concepts of uh, orchestration and automation. Uh, so I know I talked quite fast here, uh, but in conclusion, uh, so automation is becoming a core driver of all businesses, not just in IT, uh, but IT is, of course, the main driver in their respective orgs of, of implementing that. But you want to make sure you're, uh, you're properly harnessing that automation in your environment so you can stay flexible and you can stay scalable and you're not running into some of these legacy issues. Uh, and desired state management principles will allow you to do that. Uh, and then our platform, Workspace ONE, is really striving to adopt those principles and, and make sure we're introducing some advanced feature sets that let you stay as flexible and scalable as, as ever before in managing your Macs. Uh, so we have a booth downstairs. Uh, you have to walk by it if you go down the steps. Uh, so I mean, if you want to see some demo videos, talk more in depth about the challenges you face and, and how Workspace ONE can potentially help, or just ask about certain features, feel free to stop by during the conference. Uh, I've linked our uh, tech zone vmware.com website and our AUC blogs. We post lots of news, articles, technical deep dives, and things like that, so feel free to, to check in and read more. Uh, and that's all I have to say about that. So any, uh, any questions or, or comments or anything, or you can just swing by the booth later on and, and we'll all be around. Hi there. Um, so I think I've probably got a question that breaks down into two parts. First mm -hmm. of all, um, the orchestrator, the, well, the Canvas UI, yes. when you're, uh, you've got your various states uh, and workflows, how, how intensive is that on the endpoint? Because I'm guessing all the endpoint is doing is reporting to the back end, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what I've got, and the back end's going, oh, yeah, well, that's wrong. Do, <laughs> do this, do that. Yes. So, how, how quickly does that self-heal, as it were? So how often does, I don't know Workspace ONE at all, I don't know, sure, or sure. I, um, so how, how often does it check in? How quickly will that be remediated? And what's, what's the load on the device? Mm -hmm. uh, so the load on the device, kind of from a, a regular perspective, obviously it's gonna run whatever the configurations are, but uh, it basically just knows what 
uh, which of those conditions does it need to, be, does it need to periodically monitor, uh, and then based on that, it would know which of the appropriate resources would it have to run based on that. Uh, the, the kind of monitoring interval uh, is largely polling based, and it does depend on the platform, so you can schedule with some flexibility how often are you monitoring this particular data set. Uh, but we, we do expect, as uh, in the case of Apple, uh, declarative device management gets uh, a little bit more full featured that that will largely replace the need for polling. And so that, that was then going to be the second part of my question is yep. how will declarative MDM yep. can't, uh, impact this? And that's, that's our exact expectation. Obviously, when we're talking multi-platform, it'll depend on the platform. But for the case of Mac and, and iOS and the Apple platforms, uh, if your conditions are based on data supported with DDM, we just want the device reaches out, tells us something is different, and the device would automatically know do whatever you need to do now. So, thank you. Yep. <coughs> Hi, uh, thanks. Great yep. talk. Um, I'm on, also interested in this freestyle orchestrator. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool. But I just wondered from an engineering point of view, um, like building these types of things via the GUI is excellent, of course, but mm -hmm. like, can it also be, it might seem counterintuitive, but can you? do this via the API and script it, for example? For, it because is. like here, for, we have a script object, for example, sure. that maybe we don't want to copy and paste every <laughs> time. You know? Yep. Uh, so there is an API, uh, and it is something that continues to get more full featured kind of with each iteration as well. Uh, but scripts can also be part of a workflow. So I, I don't think realistically I can sit here and say, oh yeah, with Freestyle, you'll never need to script anything ever again. Like scripts will always be a component that you need to work with. But the goal is to keep those as targeted and, and small as you can. So rather than those like 500 line scripts, you would have a couple 10 or, or 20 line scripts that you could then manage in your environment independently, potentially as part of these larger workflows overall. But do you have to copy the, the script? That, say well, this is a little script that I don't know what it would be. Oh, yes. Like, would you have to copy and paste that into a workflow every time? Or like, oh. can you build this whole workflow with a JSON file or <laughs> something like that? So I, I don't know if we have JSON file support right now, but each of those resources would be independently defined in your environment. Mm -hmm. So if you have that script defined as a resource, and, and maybe sometimes you're deploying it as is, uh, you would just be able to select it to include in your workflow as a whole. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, so then like a, over time as you build out those resources, if you have the same script included in different workflows, you don't need to paste it each time. You would just reference that same, uh, same resource. Nice. Yep. Well, yeah, essentially your uh, configurations in your environment would, would be that library. You create each unique app, each unique script that you want to use, uh, and then as you're defining multiple workflows, you're essentially just referencing that library of configurations. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference.